You're listening to Bad Dog Agility, bringing you training tips, interviews, and news about the great sport of dog agility. I'm Jennifer. I'm Estevan. And I'm Sarah. And this is episode 288. Today's podcast is brought to you by HitItBoard.com and the Teeter Teach It, an easy to use tool that controls the amount of tip on your teeter so you can introduce motion to your dog in a gradual way. Go to hittedboard.com for the new Teeter Teach It and other training tools and toys. Use discount code BDA10 to get 10% off your order. That's hittedboard.com. Today, we're joined by a very special guest, and that is the 2021 Westminster High Scoring All American, Lisa Topol, and her All American Plop. Welcome to the podcast. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Esteban. Hi, Jen. Hello. I want to just tell you guys, I am a huge, huge, huge fan of Bad Dog Agility. I subscribe to it. I love the courses. I've used it in my little space in Manhattan and now a bigger space I've got uh, here in Connecticut. So I want to thank you guys. It has really helped me with my young and my old dog. So thank you. And thanks for having me. (laughs) Thank you. We're excited to have you on. Now, I mentioned that you are the reigning All-American, high-scoring All-American dog from Westminster this year, but we should also add that you are a two-time winner of this title. And if I recall, the only All-American to have won it twice, you won with Plop back in 2019 as well. Am I correct on that? That is correct. Yep. That's very exciting. (laughs) So tell our audience, let's talk a little bit about your history in agility and how you got started. Well, it's it's... Kind of, kind of a cool, weird story. I, I actually got started. Uh, it's a sad but happy story. I had a dog that had very sudden cancer and and passed away, and he passed away very, very suddenly. And I was heartbroken. He was my sole dog. I did not do agility with him. And then, literally, the next day, my best friend's mom passed away out of nowhere, and he was left with all of these dogs. And I he called me up and he basically said, you need to take one of these dogs. You need to help me and take a dog. And sort of long story short, that's how I ended up with Schmutzy. And I didn't know anything about agility. I just realized I loved sports. I loved dogs. I was in a dog park and I would go every day in the city and just train her and play with her and do tricks with her. And a person walked up to us and said, do you know what agility is? I said, the thing with the the seesaw. Yeah, that thing. And they said, I think you guys would be really great at it. You should give it a try. And <laughs> that is how I got into agility. Um, Chris, uh, I ended up in a site, uh, class with Chris Sider, actually, who I still work with today. And uh, we ended up, you know, Schmutzi ended up winning tons and tons of regional championships, Cena Sport Gold, um, IFCS. Uh, tryout medals. I mean, she was she was a great dog, but I, I knew nothing about it before her. And That's so such a great story. Dog. Let me ask you, uh, what park was this? This was Madison Square Park in in Manhattan, and it's it's nothing fancy. It's just got little kind of you know pea gravel in it, and every night I would go a little bit later so that I could have the run of the park. And mm-hmm. I this 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 dog could catch anything. She could learn anything. And so I just, I would have a blast with her. And it was just someone who had done recreational agility who saw us. And little did I know it was going to entirely and completely change my life. That's amazing. So basically <laughs> so, you were recruited like LeBron James. Is what I'm exactly <laughs> like LeBron James. I get no. compared all the time to LeBron James. <laughs> That's right. Now, uh, for, for everybody listening, you can't see her, but we can actually see her on our call. And I can see she's decked out in the Adidas gear, right? So <laughs> this is serious you know, athlete, I'm sponsored. Right? No. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Now, how long ago is that? Because I met you with Schmutzy, yeah. right? He, that, like he is the dog I recall you with, yeah. but I didn't realize you were so new to it at that time. Yeah. So how long ago was that that you got started? She's 15 now. Wow. And wow. So I, it's crazy. Um, and I guess she was probably about a year and year and a half when I was doing that. So probably, you know, 13 and a half or so years ago, which is crazy. That is crazy. I think I met you probably over 10 years ago. Yeah. Schmitzi was young. She was very young. And it was, if I recall, before I got married and I'm coming up on 10 years. So <laughs> that's how long I've known you. I knew you before you were famous. Yeah. Oh, well, thanks, Jen. I, I call you the Michael Phelps of agility. So, you know, 
there we go. Michael and LeBron were but, set. Uh, but yeah, she, I didn't know what I was doing for the first, really genuinely. She, she's a very forgiving dog and I had no idea what I was doing. She would just do courses on her own, but boy, was she fast and athletic. And once I caught up with her and learned what I was doing, it was great. And it was, she really taught me a lot. So I really, now I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Those are the best first dogs. Those dogs yeah. where, you know, they, they have so much drive on their own. Yeah. They enjoy the sport and uh, you have success right away, even though you, you know, don't know exactly what you're doing. I mean, I feel like my first dog was like that. Mm. I would say your first dog was like that. It was just, it's just such a blessing to have it that really be is. your first introduction to the sport. And, you know, it's, it's, since I know a lot of this is about all Americans, it was really funny because when I came in with her, I think there was even less successful all Americans. There really just really wasn't any. And even when I would go to the start line and things with her, people would tell me like, oh, you don't need to expect a lot from her. It was a very odd thing. And I was always like, yeah, I do. I expect the same from her as anyone expects from their dogs. And it it just took us time because of me, but she she could beat any border collie on any day. I mean she was she was an amazing athlete. And there you go. I mean any dog can be a winner. <laughs> Yeah, I now, think it's definitely. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say that I think there's definitely been an evolution in yeah. how people, especially within the AKC, as both the um, yes, you know, the, the leadership and the uh, you know uh, members view all American dogs, right? And I think it was a real milestone when the AKC said, "Okay, we are going to welcome mixed breed dogs into all of our programs," right? It, and it was, yeah. It, because I, she was an incredibly successful dog and a really good mm -hmm. dog. And I couldn't compete in most of the big events. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, I wasn't allowed to, and I wanted to do AKC and I couldn't. And before they actually allowed mixed breeds in, there was a proposal to allow mixed breeds in, in their own category all the time mm -hmm. so that every trial they, they would be in their own category. And I wrote the AKC a letter and said that I'm not down with that. I said, if I, if I'm going to win things, I want to win things against all the dogs. That's what I want to do. So I don't want a different category and actually waited a, a little bit, you know, before I was sort of even ready to do AKC, but she was actually one of the very, very first mixed breeds to, to do AKC. I think they did an article on her years and years ago about, uh, the first trial she did because she was one of the first to ever compete. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah that, that's amazing. Now your recent Westminster wins were yeah. with plop, right? A yeah. different mixer. Right. We're talking a lot about schmitzy, but, but tell <laughs> us a bit about plop now as yeah. the two time winner and, yeah. and kind of your history with her, but also her very unique name. I want the story behind that well, one. It's a he, but oh, he, okay. So, yes. So the, the history with Plop, I, the funny thing that does happen, and maybe it happens, I couldn't even tell you because I don't know, but maybe it happens with people who have pure breeds also. But when you have a mixed breed that does well, because Schmutzy did well, I cannot, anytime there was any kind of cattle dog mix that was a rescue that they thought could be a good agility dog, I got an email or I got a face. <laughs> right. Mm. And I wasn't, I genuinely was not looking. And I got them all the time and I'd look and I'd be like, yeah, thank you. But I'm not interested in a, in another dog. And then one day there was a dog on Facebook, literally through Facebook, this was plot. And a few of my friends uh, sent him to me and said, this dog is so cute. It's a mini schmutzy. You've got to look at this one. And, you know, I was like, oh, whatever, I'll look. And I swear it's so dumb that you could know from a Facebook post. But I just looked at him and he was demented and funny. And he has this sort of little toupee on his head. And these silly little ears. And I just thought, I'm like, I think that's my dog. I, I have to get this dog. And he was out of control and ridiculous. And, uh, you know, but I don't know. I just had an affinity to him. And I, I reached out to the rescue group. And I ended up with Plop. His name is kind of because he plopped in my lap. <laughs> and so that's how we, we got we got Plop. Um yeah, he's got a very silly AKC name because I was at, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know if we want to include this, but Plop has a very silly AKC name because I thought, oh, he doesn't have a, a breeder's name. I don't have anything. I'm going to give him the most 
ridiculous name I could think of. And his AKC name is Frumpy Dump Pants Paints the Town Brown, which is his whole name. Um, though I don't, I don't use that, but um, I couldn't believe they let me do it, actually. Um, that is his, his official name. Um, but yeah, that's really how I got him. And then he was in Florida and uh, my friends actually brought him up. And that was the first time I saw him. He was crazy, but he loved me. I mean, I sound stupid, but he loved me the second I saw him and I loved him. And it has been an incredible relationship. And there's just sort of a, a bond that I think is kind of rare with dogs. I I, I shouldn't say that because I think a lot of people have that special bond with their dogs. But mm -hmm. I just do, I do think his is, is particularly special. Uh, well, how old was he when you got him? He was a they don't really know, but 10 oh, months, yeah. about, ten, about yeah. 10, about 10 months, something around there. So a little bit under a year. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and he just, he clearly had, he was super fat. He clearly had, I honestly think he was just put in a crate because he had too much energy. Uh -huh. um, and that's so typical of, of rescues is especially ones that are good at agility Border collies are are put in shelters all the time because of that, because there's there's because of their drive and their need to be active. Um, people just don't know what to do with it. So so Plop was considered like a troubled child. But the truth is, I mean, he didn't know how to sit. He didn't know how to do anything. And he was almost a year old. And he just I brought him home and he literally sort of did three sixties off my wall. He just bounced off it and bounced off it and just jumped on everything. Um, so it took a little bit of time with him to sit was really our big goal. <laughs> for a very long time. Um, and once he got that the sky was the limit because he was just, he was so smart, but yeah, I think, I think rescues are filled with dogs that actually make great agility prospects. Um, but not necessarily regular pet home prospects because they're, they're not dogs that will just sit on your lap and do nothing. So, right. You're oh, saying yeah, that they sure. end up there because of their energy. So yeah. you're going to, they're going to tend towards the more energetic side, all things being equal. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, I was watching your run right before this podcast and, you know, to prepare and um, uh, whatever it is, this dog definitely has it. Right. Yeah. And I was watching him run and it reminded me so much of our Rottweiler, you know, and just hearing really? a lot of the things that you say, even in picking out the name, you know, <laughs> for mm -hmm. the AKC, the registered name. And we didn't understand that there were kennels and, and breeders would have you, you know, put the yeah. kennel name in that and that kind of stuff, you know? So I, I thought that was pretty interesting. We just, right. we, we gave our, our dog a very normal name as if it were a child. We, <laughs> we named her Samantha and her last name. So her registered name was Samantha Fernandez Lopez. <laughs> like, like a real, like a real person. I mean, how, I am, I, how am I just now finding this out? <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, the, Wait, so which the story short, is crazier? Right. Hers or ours? The, the I short, love yours. I love it. <laughs> the short, the short version of the story is that she was our first dog, our first purebred dog. And for us, a purebred dog was, we like bought her on the side of the road where they had a tent and they were selling Rottweiler puppies for Cash $300 only. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so we like, so that was our first purebred dog. There was no research. There was no breeders. It was just like, we had always just gotten strays at the pound and this was a step up by, you know, it looked like an actual identifiable dog. And so uh, we got her and then short, uh, short story, but um, we never got the papers on her. And so we ILP'd her, which was the thing yep. before pal. Yep, I know, I know. We didn't have uh, any Kindle name. And so we named her Samantha Fernandez Lopez. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and she was amazing. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. What I think is super cool about your story, Lisa, um, is that not only are we talking all Americans and you are the reigning all American winner, but they're also rescues, right? Plop and Schmutzy. Yeah. are also rescues, which is yeah. kind of a unique um, aspect to the mixed breeds as we go into 2021, yeah. because what we're seeing is a lot more um, purposely bred mixed breeds. So yeah. what's your take mm -hmm. on mixed breeds as rescues that we've seen a lot in the past and now starting to get into um, sport mixes or whatever, yeah. you know, they may refer to them as, but purposely bred mixes yeah. still being considered all Americans. And, and does that change your what are your thoughts, I guess, rather? Well, first, I'll just start by saying I'm definitely not, I, I'm not one of those precious sort of 
stop, you know, uh, shop, adopt, don't, don't, what is it? Adopt, shop, adopt, don't shop, right? I think that's the phrase. Yeah. <laughs> right. I think the phrase is adopt, don't shop. I'm not, I'm not one of those. I mean, I honestly feel like if you give a dog a good home, you give a dog a good home and a, and a responsible breeder is great. I, I have got no trouble with any of that. And in fact, I, all of my, I have five dogs and four of them are rescues. And one of them is not, she is a, she's a sport bred mix that I, I got uh, from a friend of mine. And when I was at Westminster this year, that exact question went through my head because I thought to myself, she's, she's probably the next dog in line for me to sort of compete uh, competitively with. And I thought, how would I feel about her being in the all American category? And honestly, it feels weird to me. And I, I know that, Mm. you know, that that's what the category is, but a sport bred mix is different to me than, than a rescue. And I, I have a purebred rescue. I have a border collie who's a purebred rescue. And I almost imagine she's, she's 14 now, but I would almost imagine her you know, sort of more in that same category as plop than I would my, my, my sport bread mix. Um, I love them both. And I think it's both great, but I think in the past, um, all American tended to parallel with um, rescue. And I 100% think that has changed radically. I think probably um, this year there there was there was a few um, sport bread mixes that 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 were in the hunt, and I think next year it's going to be even greater. Um, there's so many dogs that that I know that are incredibly competitive that are sport bread mixes, and it just it feels like a slightly different thing to me because I'm not sure I can't read the AKC's mind. But I'm not sure that that's what they necessarily meant to celebrate when they talked about All-American. I actually think they were thinking more towards sort of the the dogs that were rescue dogs or shelter dogs, not necessarily purpose-bred sport mixes. I love I love the sport mixes. Like I said, I have one, but they do they do feel different to me. So it's a little bit interesting. And I won I actually wonder where the category will go as there become so many. Um, that are all purpose bred, and a lot, a lot of them. I think a lot of the border pups are going to look just like border collies, <laughs> like little border collies too. <laughs> right, right. That is super interesting. That's a great question, Jen. It never even crossed my mind, and then as soon as you asked it, I thought, "Huh, that's pretty interesting." And your response, uh, very well put. And I, I feel like I have to give some kind of hot take here. I, I think with the AKC, there was an intent. <laughs> just as you as you pointed out to to really focus on kind of the rescue mixed breed as opposed yeah. to the intentionally bred for sport whether it's fly ball or agility um and i think you would lose a little something unless you decided well we're going to get rid of the all-american category altogether well the the only problem with that then becomes where do they because they have they deserve to to go to Westminster too right mm-hmm. you just have mm-hmm. the question of well then what category would they compete in because, mm-hmm. right because Westminster is is very different it really is about showcasing breeds right and showcasing different kinds of dogs so I don't know that you actually can get rid of it because I would love to see those sport bred mixes have the chance sure to win. No, and the invitational as well yeah, right. Um, the invitational as the well. The other thing exactly. I would do, just back to my hot take. This is just off the top of my head. I would create. I would. I would. I would literally make them a new breed category, maybe where they're not like a recognizable breed with breeding, but you can register them as a breed. So if you had. What what are common mixes? Like what's a common mix? A border well, like a, pap is border paps are popular. Border, border with it, golden doodle. Border okay, so those are all 50-50, but are there also three quarter quarter oh, mixes yeah. or when? Yeah. Yeah. So Some I would put ones. each of them into <laughs> excuse me. So I think I would put each of them into their own category and I, w- I would keep stats. I, wonder, <laughs> I think you're crazy. No, it could be know, because look, if you had gold, let's say you had golden doodles, right? Yeah. Westminster. And now, now, you know, there's three, three ESPNs and Fox agility events. So <laughs> yeah. let's, say, let's say 10 or 20 years from now, golden doodles are actually like almost as popular as regular old golden retrievers and labs. Like they're really a high percent of the pet population. Uh, and they're brought into agility more and more. And, you know, the breeders become very serious and they start taking the best, most competitive poodles and the best, most competitive goldens. And then they they have these golden noodle lines. And then now you have dozens and dozens, like over a hundred, maybe golden doodles. Like why not, you know, they, they, you you put them in their own category. You don't recognize them as a breed and there's not going to be confirmation and all this stuff, 
but for the purpose of sport, and I think here specifically agility. Yeah. I don't. I don't know. I, I think. And I think Westminster can. can I don't think they would. That. I don't think. I, I don't see how it's even feasible because now you're saying like, why don't you AKC keep track of a whole bunch of breeds exactly. that you don't recognize, <laughs> just so that we can keep stats on them? Like you and I would love those stats, but you I don't could see possibly be. do like a registered. I get what right. you're saying, Esteban. A registered right. mix where mm-hmm. like the mother is an AKC registered dog and the father is an AKC registered dog. That's what we do tend to see with the sport mixes, right? They're yeah. they're not just intentionally bred, but they're intentionally bred from generally speaking, good lineage and health testing and, and whatnot. Sure. And then you have your mixed breeds that are from the shelter and you know nothing right. about it. I, I mean, know, so you right. could kind of have a registered mixed breed versus PAL or ILP mixed breed. I don't know that you're going to see those divided out into different categories, but the whole question of uh, intentional mixes and accidentals, uh, you know, you brought up the uh, point, Lisa, that it crossed your mind at Westminster. It certainly crossed my mind with regard to international events because we, we aren't seeing a lot, or at least I'm not seeing a lot of mixes internationally like i'm not seeing a lot of the big handlers yeah. in europe um, with these mixes but they're being very popular here so i keep thinking like why don't they have border whippets why don't they have border packs yeah. and, and awc the agility world championship doesn't allow mixed breeds yeah. and i think that if that were to change it might be in three years it might be in 20 years you're going to see things change i know it's like speaking for myself i am certainly in no way yeah. against a mixed breed whether it be a rescue or intentional but knowing that my goals are AWC and some of those bigger events. I'm hesitant because of what that means I can do. So yeah, it definitely will something will be something that evolves over the year, both through AKC, Westminster, Invitational, you know, everything to see where it goes. Well, you know, one one of the things about I I competed, I I made a WAO and the IFCS world team with with PLOP uh, a few years before COVID, pre-COVID. Uh, the, the year right before that. And I did, I noticed the same thing, Jen, that when I, I was abroad, people were fascinated by him. Like people stopped to take pictures with him because they were so <laughs> not used to seeing, like he had a little, little cheering section in the Netherlands because they were just not used to seeing a genuine mutt <laughs> at the, at that level. It is very rare. Um, and I do think it's the same thing abroad. And I do think the reasoning, a huge part of that is because of AWC. I think right. that because AWC doesn't allow them, I know I can never compete in it. So if you want that opportunity, you cannot, you cannot have a, 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 a mixed breed. So I think that probably does dictate some of what you're seeing abroad as well. And I, I would love to see that change because I think the, the mentality that AKC is bringing in, which is this isn't confirmation. This is about athletics in a sport. And so let's celebrate dogs. So I do kind of feel like it'd be pretty cool if they, if they allowed them at, at AWC as well. And I think you'd see a huge increase um, in the number of dogs like that, um, which I, I think would be pretty neat. And as far as the sport bread and rescue, I think you could do that at AKC. I don't think they would ever do by, you know, a golden doodle or a, a border whip it. I don't think they could ever do that, but it would be interesting if maybe they did, um, sport sport bread as a category and then rescue as a category. And then it could be a rescue border collie competing against a rescue mixed breed. Right. Because it's a, it's a different, interesting thing, but yeah, it's the only event where, where it matters. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's come such a very, very long way. Like just oh, yeah. thinking back to our history in it, which is a, a little bit longer than yours and um, about the same as Jen's. <laughs> Um, but when we started, you know, that first dog that we had that was a Rottweiler, but we didn't have papers. So, you know, we were limited in some of the events that we could do with her at first. And then our second dog was, um, a miniature Australian shepherd, but before they became an AKC breed. So, and that dog was also very, very good. And so we constantly had our eye on like becoming um, an AKC breed. Are we going to be able to do FCI? Can we do AWC? And then that was all pre uh, WAO and, and things like that. And so um, there were fewer opportunities and then it started to become almost moot about whether uh, we were purebred or not, because there were so many opportunities opening up 
where there were a couple that were still closed down, yeah. right? But it was just those couple and there were so many other things that could be done. And so I would love to see it completely open up, um, you know, on yeah, the Agility World Championship side. Mm -hmm. But from my perspective, in years in the sport, it's so different now than it was when we first started. It's really cool to see that. Right. I mean, yeah, European Open though, they take right. They do grades, right. So I, I don't, do. I don't see why they. But they that. didn't. But you couldn't do you couldn't do EO either because you couldn't get the qualifiers to try out for the European Open because you couldn't go to to the local AKC events. So for, mm. so for Schmutzi, for example, I think I got to go once to. To, to a tryout later in her career uh, because I oh. could not. And I, and then you have to get the, you know, you couldn't just do premier. You had to, then you had to get the, I think it was an AX or maybe it was an MX MXJ. I can't remember, right, right. but i sort of had to rush and get through weekends very quickly when, when she finally got a lot. So you actually did miss out on, on EO. You could only do sort of USDAA IFCS and there was no UKI either. Right. Recently. So your international opportunities were very, very limited uh, until, until recently. Wait, wait. I have a quick question. I just have to jump in here with it. How do you spell schmutzy <laughs> on the uh, the competitor sheet, on the uh, check-in sheet? It's a, it's, a, it's a Yiddish word. It's S-C-H-M-U-T-Z-Y. It's a, it's a word gotcha. my, my grandmother used to use. It. It's like, it's from the German word schmutzy. It's like when you get like stuff in your in your eyes you got you have schmutz schmutzig in your eye uh -huh. it means you're dirty and if you look at schmutzy she's all like dirty spots all over her so that's how she got the name nice gotcha. nice <laughs> yeah i think the progression over the years of mixed breeds has has really evolved and kind of getting back to westminster not only do they have this high scoring all american award but it actually is written in the rules that they must take an all American from each height to finals. I yep. mean, that's huge. Not only are they saying all Americans can come to Westminster, but they're saying that we will make sure an all American from each height makes finals and then hopefully makes it on TV. And I think that that's great for our sport and great for people who do have rescues or do have mixes to watch and see, Oh, Hey, there's a mixed breed. There's a, Mutt, you know, just like mine that's out yeah. there doing it versus feeling like, oh, this is Westminster and it's these pristine, pristine all breeds and I have a mixed breed or I have a rescue. Um, so it's not going to work. But does that play into a little bit of your strategy? I know you commented mm -hmm. earlier that you were aware of other mixed breeds at Westminster this year. Um, I know given how the rules were, I had an eight inch Sheltie this year. So knowing that they take that breed diversity into finals, the first thing I did was look at the gate sheet and go, how many other Shelties are in eight inches? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so tell us a little bit about like Westminster specifically about that event and your strategy at that event or how that uh, event yeah. compares to other events throughout the year. It affects me a lot. And first, I do think you still have to get one cue in your two rounds. I think even if yes, you're I, you are there, correct. Oh, okay. it's, yeah, yeah, you have to have at That's least the first one thing I was going to ask. Yeah, Sorry, because I, I there was no does. 24 inch all American this year. Yeah. I went and looked and I saw there was one every height, but there was none in the um, 24 inch. And so I assume it's because nobody met those qualifications. Yeah, you still have to meet the same qualifications as everybody else. Um, but it, I absolutely know it's a, it's a different, it's the only event where I'm competing very specifically against other all Americans and, and even more so because there's a specific award for it. So right. I, frankly, I don't look at any other dog in the competition, except I say, okay, who are the other all Americans that I need to focus on and what do I need to do? And cause I know, I know I've got to get a cue. Like I, I know that to start with, to be able to get in the final. Um, and so uh, even if I look at this year, I actually didn't particularly love my, my finals run, but I did quite like my qualifying runs. And I push it a little bit harder in the qualifying runs because I feel like, okay, there's some good, some really good all Americans in there, especially in the 12 inch category. There are some really, really good ones, some world team um, 12 inch dogs in there. And so I just felt like that's where I have to push it, have a really good time. And I got to make sure I'm clean in one of them. Mm -hmm. Once I did that, I mean, it's sort of what you said, Jen, where you kind of look at who you're competing against. And again, it's very unique to Westminster. Um, then by the time I made the finals, I knew who the other All-Americans were. And looking at it, I kind of was like, 
I think if I go clean, I'm going to win. Um, And I don't normally go in with them and that mentality, to be honest, like normally, like when I'm trying out for the world teams or if I'm trying to win UKI, you know, events or any of the other big events, when I get to the final rounds, it's the opposite. I just, I go for broke and I'm sort of like, all right, I gotta, I gotta go as fast as I can, as hard as I can, if I want to make this team, if I want to get on. So I sort of have a little bit of a different mentality. And with this, honestly, a little bit more careful in, in the finals than I would normally be. And cause I felt like if I'm clean, I've got a really good shot at it. Um, and in a way I think it affected me and made the run not as good because I actually feel like I run a little bit better when I, when I run more aggressively. So I was a little, right. bit, annoyed. It's a little bit annoyed at myself, to be honest. Um, and because Plop had come off surgery, he was really sticky. And so a dog that I'm used to be able to sort of send to anything was like, I'm not leaving your side. And so yeah. it, was, it was a little bit hard for me to navigate, but we, we got through it clean. And honestly, that kind of was my goal, not to go slow, but to be a little more thoughtful, I think about it and not take silly risks to gain time. It was be smart and be practical and do what he does best. And don't worry too much about trying to pick up a 10th of a second here or, or a 10th of a second there, run smart and run clean. And I, that, I think that's when I thought about it. Right. I mean, I think that's really smart though. I mean, like every, every run that you do, even in practice, every run that you do has a goal, right? And the goals are different and they affect like how you handle, how you deal with mistakes and, uh, you know, and everything. And I see people make mistakes about, uh, in terms of not paying attention to what their goal is in the moment. And so in practice, you know, their dog breaks the start and they continue running, right? There's no penalty for stopping. (laughs) You shouldn't do that. Right. So they're making, they're making not the right decision. They're given the goal of practice, right? Which is not to just go out there and get it clean. There's no reward that you're going to get, right? It's about training. It's about preparing your dog, right? And then here you have like a very different scenario where like the 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 goal, the, the overarching goal, like ideally you'll have a beautiful, perfect run. You'll get first place and you'll win, right? Yeah. But if you got to rank order them, winning is the top goal, right? And yeah. so you stuck to that, made sure that you had it, you know, really concentrated on that. I like what you say about like not taking silly risks. Like I, you know, it is hard. Sometimes you just get into the mentality of, you know, how can I do everything just so, and then shoot yourself in the foot. So keeping your eye on like the ultimate prize and knowing that that prize changes from like run to run competition to competition. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's funny when I, 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 I teach agility and I know when I, when I, when I'm working with my own, own students, sometimes we'll do a run. I'll be like, that's great. If what you wanted was a cue. Right. <laughs> and I'd be like, that's great. Now let's run it to win the class. Right. And it's very, very different. And I, I having said that, I never think it's wise to go, I'm going to try something I've never tried before here in a big competition. <laughs> Because, and you see that a lot where someone's like, I'm going to try something crazy. And right. you've never, you've never practiced it. That's not a good idea either. But it really is figuring out exactly what you said, Sarah, which is, is my goal, you know, I've got to have the fastest, I've got to just go for broke, or I have got to be, have a smart cue. And in this case, like I said, the earlier rounds were a little bit more aggressive for me. And the final was a little bit more because I felt like I was competing in a very, very small limited category for me. Like I wanted to win the top all American. And so for me, it was, that's my goal. That's what I'm focusing on. Um, And so, yes, I I think I was a a little bit more conservative than, than I would normally be in a, in a finals kind of situation. Right. So what did you think about the course, like the course design, how it ran? Yeah. I, I thought it was very fair and fun. Um, is, is I think what I thought of it. I don't think it was super complicated. I think there's one challenging line sort of right in the middle of the, of the course, right. um, that you really needed to get down and you needed to move, uh, to, to kind of make it happen. Um, what I like about Westminster in general, um, is, and I think you alluded to it, um, Jen is this is the chance for people that never watch agility to watch agility. 
Mm-hmm. And so I don't think that they're building the courses to be the hardest international course ever. I right. think they're building it for people to see dogs have fun and to see handlers have fun and to have a good run. So I, I feel like it was, there was no, there was no stupid challenges in it. There wasn't anything where I thought, my God, what a horrible you know plan that was. I actually thought it was a nice, good flowing course with good, fair challenges. And I actually felt that way about the, the early rounds as well. Um, so I thought it was really good for that, especially, you know, I know this year is different because it wasn't, it was in Tarrytown and it wasn't in Manhattan, but especially when you're in Manhattan, I mean, the crowds go crazy. You know, they see a dog do weave poles and they're just so excited. And I do think that's part of the, the what you were mentioning earlier, um, Jen, about that's the, the allure of having an all American dog do it because so many people in that crowd, that's what they have. Right. And you think, oh, I can only do this with the border collie or the fancy dog that's bred for it. And this is the chance to say, nope, any dog can do this. And I think the courses are amenable to that. I think that they make it so that, you know, you can you can really see some dogs just kind of go out and have fun and not have a bazillion um, NQs. So I, I think they were I think it was a nice course. Very cool. OK, now I've got five quick questions for you. I'm going to have <laughs> to make up five. But let me start with number one. <laughs> okay. Number one. Uh, expected criteria for the dog walk is running dog walk, or does he have a stop and you just ran him through for the final? He has a, he has a stop, and when it's it, it's it, it's in a final, he kind of did a little bit, and he's been to be honest, this is dog coming it was, back. It was from a injury. nice hit. Yeah, yeah, he's been creeping since since he came back from surgery, uh-huh. and uh, you know, I was sort of like, all right, he's moving, he's moving. I want to keep him moving, and I just and I kind of just let him move, and gotcha. I could I knew he was going to be based on where I was. Cause I had to actually not go where I would normally be for the dog walk with him. Mm-hmm. Um, I knew he was, he was in the contact. So I was okay. Okay. Question number two, a frame criteria running or stopped running. Okay. Running question, question number three, weave pull method. How did you teach the weave poles to this dog? I am, am big. It's his favorite obstacle. Uh, I am big on, sh- on shaping and sort of a, a, a modified two by two. I, I, I don't particularly do channel or, or do um, guides. I, I just like, I like to watch them really sort of think it out and learn it out with some really simple shaping. And all my dogs are really, really good weavers. Um, and that's, that's how I do it. So it's, it's essentially kind of two by two, but I, I let them take the time to really figure it out. And then when they do, they go and and they all are have really great understanding of their entries uh, and of staying in in the weeds. So all right, well, very cool. Okay, question number four: Which of these three crosses is your favorite? Blind, <laughs> rear, or front? <laughs> it's definitely not a front. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm sure of that because even even when I think I'm early, I'm late. So that's <laughs> that's always the case with the front crosses. I have really crappy knees. So the blinds are a godsend because Mm -hmm. uh, I can do them. My dogs happen to have incredibly good rears, all of them very tight and sort of much sort of looser ones. And I think it is undervalued and underappreciated. So agreed. I love, I love blinds, but so many times I, I, all the time, I remember um, this was this was with Schmutzi. She won a um, USDAA uh, Grand Prix. I did rears the entire course. That's what it was built to do. And mm-hmm. the judge actually said to me after, you're the only one who knew what I built the course for. <laughs> I could just tell. I was like, everyone's going to try different things. But the truth is, if you just reared, it was built for it. And so I think people think it means you're lazy or you're bad or you can't do the other ones if you do a rear. And I just don't think that's the case. I think sometimes it is the smartest, best move to actually get you ahead where you want to be ahead. And it sets up the, the most natural turn for the dog. So I'm maybe the biggest fan of rears, but I personally, I love blinds. So that kind of answers. I gave you a double answer. All right. No, I 1000% percent agree with you on rears. Yeah. And yeah. I, I'm just going to holler out to one of uh, our VIPers who just today I emailed her a speech about rears. <laughs> and it was basically exactly that. Like it is, it is a great maneuver. It has its place. Uh, it doesn't necessarily make your dog slower. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, it's, it's so fantastic. 
Yep. On time yeah. rear and a late front. I'll take the on time rear. That's exactly what I said. <laughs> I was like a good rear beats a bad front every yeah. day. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. And now your fifth and final question. This is a tough one. You've shown in a lot of different big events. What has been your absolute favorite? If you pay, if you say Westminster, if you pick Westminster, you have to tell me which Westminster, which the, your, your favorite, your all time favorite. So hard. It is a, it's a toss up between two. <laughs> it is. Okay, we'll I'll, allow I'll it. We'll allow, allow it. We'll allow okay. It. Uh, WAO in the Netherlands, because I just thought it was so well run. Mm, it was mm-hmm. so much fun. It was just the international feel of it was so welcoming. And I made so many friends there. And I thought the courses were great and challenging. And Plop was hurt there. He actually was when I realized he was hurt. But the experience was was fantastic. And the first Westminster, um, mm. because it was the first time ever that my family got to see me do agility because I, I live in New York city. And so for them all to come and to hear my friends and my family screaming in that crowd, just, you, you just can't beat that every, you know, every other time you talk about agility, it, they're like, yeah, yeah, great, good. They don't know what I'm talking about at all. And so this was the first time I think they got to see it and they got to see the fun and the excitement of it. And so I think that's the other thing that really can't be beat. So those those are my two favorites. Awesome. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been such a fun podcast. Uh, you, you've had a pleasure to have on and speak with. And I think everyone would agree you are a fantastic ambassador for all Americans and then for our sport as a whole. So congratulations again. And uh, will you be coming back next year? Will you go? Well, will you go back? You know, Plop, like I, I think I've mentioned, he he had a pretty he had a pretty bad injury and I didn't even know if we were going to come back this year. Um, mm-hmm. Been very, very limited in what we've done. He's starting really now um, to look like himself again just now, but I'm not sure that I want to push his schedule too much. Um, so I'm really going to, I'm going to have to see, I won't be sad if we leave Westminster winning twice. It, it, it won't, it won't depress me to no end. And I don't, I never, ever much as I love doing it. And I know he does. I never, ever want to push him beyond his own limits and his own boundaries. So I kind of just have to see how he is and, We'll, we'll go from there. I've got, I've got, uh, the sport mix and I have another, uh, all American rescue <laughs> that I, that I just got named poopsie because it's a female. She's the female plop. They look alike. They talk alike. It's like the, the Patty Duke show. It's ridiculous. And I also got her through Facebook. People sent her to me and I didn't have any intention to have her and here she is. She's home with me. So I've, I've got plenty of other dogs I can take to, to Westminster in the future. <laughs> in the, in the all American category coming up. So, well, if you make it back next year, we'll, we'll root for a third win (laughs) for you. That's right. So it's been a pleasure to have you on. Thank Thank you you. for your time. Been a pleasure, really, truly a pleasure to be here. You guys, you guys are great. And I I really appreciate uh, you talking with me. All right. Thank you so much. We'd like to thank our sponsor, hitaboard.com. Happy training.